The scripture lesson this morning is from Joshua chapter 6, verses 8 to 20. After Joshua spoke to the people, the seven priests with the ram's horns started marching in the presence of the Lord, blowing their trumpets as they marched, and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed behind them. Some of the armed men marched in front of the priest with the horns and some behind the ark, with the priest continually blowing the horns. Do not shout. Do not even talk, Joshua commanded. Not a single word from any of you until I tell you to shout. Then shout. So the ark of the Lord was carried around the town once that day, and then everyone returned to spend the night in the camp. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priest again carried the ark of the Lord. The seven priests with the ram's horns marched in front of the ark of the Lord, blowing their horns. Again, the armed men marched both in front of the priest with the horns and behind the ark of the Lord. All this time, the priests were blowing their horns. On the second day, they marched around the town once and returned to the camp. They followed this pattern for six days. On the seventh day, the Israelites got up at dawn and marched around the town as they had done before. But this time, they went around the town seven times. The seventh time around, as the priests sounded the long blast on their horns, Joshua commanded the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the town. Jericho had everything in it, and everything in it must be completely destroyed as an offering to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and the others in her house will be spared, for she protected our spies. Do not take any of the things set apart for the destruction or you yourselves will be completely destroyed, and you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into his treasury. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horns, they shouted as, they, as loud as they could. Suddenly, the walls of Jericho collapsed, and the Israelites charged straight, into the town and captured it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Beth, for sharing God's word with us this morning. Yogi Berra had a lot of uh, sayings that were kind of strange but made a lot of sense. And one that I've been thinking about this week is, it's deja vu again. Deja vu is when you think you're experiencing something you've experienced before, but you're not really sure. When that happens again, well, who knows what's going on. But as I've been watching the coverage of the events in Orlando, I keep thinking it's deja vu all over again. How often have we been through this as a nation? Back to Columbine, 9-11. The school up in Connecticut, probably many more times than I could remember or would want to remember. And it always seems to follow the same pattern. There's a terrible disaster that happens. And, of course, it's all over the media. And the media, it seems, do their best to show the most outrageous footage as often as possible. And then the media begin to speculate on why this happened, as if we could find answers to something as absurd as evil. Well, in this case, maybe it's terrorism, but then again, maybe it's not. Was he a terrorist? Was he not? We don't really know, do we? Maybe it was a hate crime, but then again, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was somebody who was insane, but then again, maybe it wasn't. We really don't know. We have to find an explanation, it seems, somehow that comforts us. If we think we understand, we think maybe we can keep it from happening again. But I think part of the nature of evil is that it denies that understanding. Because evil by its nature is irrational. Makes no sense. Because I think the real reason behind all this has happened is something beyond terrorism, something deeper than a hate crime or somebody who's insane. 
I think there's a presence of evil in this world. Part of God's creation has rebelled against him and will do anything to undermine the life and the love that God upholds. The Bible calls him Satan. And I believe that's the real story behind all of these incidents, all this deja vu again that we've seen. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says this, For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's where our struggle is. That's what's behind all of these terrible things we see happening in the news every day, sometimes right here in our own hometown. There's evil loose in the world. And I believe only God has the answer as to how to deal with that evil. It's not easy for us. We think, God, why don't you do something now? Every Sunday we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why isn't that prayer answered, prayed by billions of Christians every week, that that God's will be done, God's will of perfect love, perfect justice? What stands in the way? Why hasn't it happened yet? We long for the kingdom of God, the kingdom where there will truly be peace, where there will be no more hatred, no more suffering, no more pain. We long for that promised land the kingdom of God. I think there are some parallels with our situation and the situation of Joshua here in chapter 6. For Joshua is also longing for the promised land, in this case a physical land, the land of Canaan, that God has promised to Joshua and to all of God's people. And yet Joshua just can't walk in and take over. There are obstacles that stand in the way of Joshua before he can enter that promised land, before he can take possession of that promised land. It takes Joshua a long time, almost 40 years, to conquer the promised land, and then they don't get all of it. They just get most of it. But the first obstacle they face is Jericho. Jericho is a strong city, big, tall wall, thick wall, almost impregnable. It's a gateway into the promised land. And so if Joshua and the Israelites are to go further, they have to somehow defeat and conquer Jericho, the only way into the promised land. Our warfare is spiritual. Their warfare is physical. But again, I think there are some things we can carry over from Joshua into our present-day dilemma and our present-day concerns. first thing we learn from Joshua is faithfulness. Always trust in God's promises. Joshua has seen this impregnable city. He knows it's going to be impossible to take in human strength, and yet he knows also that God has promised him the victory. And all he has to do is trust in God, and the victory will come. And I think the victory comes only by the hand of God. I've read various commentaries about Jericho, and there's always been speculation as to why the walls fall down. Somehow we have to find a rational explanation. One explanation I remember reading is that while the Israelites were busy marching around the city, there were other Israelites who were digging tunnels and undermining the walls. They would would all fall down on the seventh day. Well, sounds good, but you can't do that in seven days. Believe me, it's not possible. Another explanation I remember seeing is that somehow on that last day when all the trumpets blew and everybody shouted, that sound wave was so strong it just blew the walls over. Wow. We turned the volume all the way up with the sound system. Do you think we could blow the roof off the church? No, don't think so. Maybe give us a headache, but it won't blow the roof off the church. Sound waves are not that powerful. Didn't happen that way. Some people speculate that when the people in Jericho saw the Israelites marching around the city, they became so terrified that they just naturally gave up and opened the gates. It's kind of a metaphor. Don't think that happened either. I think what really happened 
is that God miraculously destroyed the walls of that city. Not something susceptible to human explanation because it was an act of God to destroy those walls, to cast them down, to give God's people the victory. And so when we seek the victory today, it's not our own wisdom and strength that are going to gain that victory. As hard as we try to understand what happens, as hard as we try to prevent it from happening again, in ourselves, we don't have the power to defeat the evil that's in this world. Only God has that power. And just as God threw down the walls of Jericho, God is now in the process of throwing down the power of evil in this world until that day when Jesus returns and in that final victory, evil is totally overthrown. In the meantime, before that day, I think what God is doing is tearing down walls. Not the walls around the city of Jericho, but the walls around human hearts that keep the love of God on the outside. The problem is that we're all sinners. We've all built walls in our hearts to keep God out because we don't want God telling us what to do. We don't want God running our lives. We think we're God. We don't think God should be God. We think we should be God. Thousands of reasons. We build these walls to keep God out. And as long as God is on the outside, all that sinfulness and evil and influence of Satan brews within us, destroys our souls, sometimes even leads us into acts of terrible violence. The only answer comes when somehow God gets through that wall and the light of God shines on our souls and the forgiveness of God takes away the sin and the evil and the love of God fills our hearts. I believe what God is doing in the world today is breaking down those walls around human hearts so that God's love can come in. And once God's love is inside, once Jesus Christ reigns within us, then all that sin and evil is gone. And we're transformed by God's almighty love. God is breaking down those walls that surround our hearts. So how do you break down walls around people's hearts? Well, the logical way we think would be, well, you yell at people, you discipline people, you get mad at people. That's how you break down those walls, but that's not how God did it, is it? God knew that the only way to break those walls down was for him to send his son to die on the cross. It's totally counterintuitive. But breaking down the walls of our hearts requires the manifestation of God's love in Jesus Christ. And so God sent his son. God himself became one of us. God himself suffered. God himself died. God himself sacrificed everything for us. Because only as we see that amazing love of God that love that was willing to give everything for our sake. Only then do we hear Jesus knock on the door of our hearts. And only then can we be led to open the door, to invite Jesus in to forgive us our sin, to take away that hatred, to take away that strife, to take away that evil, to take away that sin. Only by the power of God's love revealed to us in Jesus Christ Can those walls be broken down? Can our hearts and our lives be transformed? God's greatest power in this world is the power of his love. And of course we know that someday Jesus will come again. And those hearts that resist him now, when that day comes, they will no longer resist. Paul tells us that on that day, every knee shall bow, In heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That that day will come when all those walls are broken down. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And Jesus' love will reign throughout all of his new creation. And on that day there will be no more suffering, no more hatred, no more death. God is true 
to his promise. First thing we learn from Joshua at Jericho is that God is true to his promise that God will win the victory. The second thing we learn from Joshua is obedience. Now just imagine that you're one of the Israelites and Joshua says, guess what? We're going out to march. We're going to march around the city. What good is that going to do, Joshua? Marching around walls, that's not going to do any good. So they go out and march around the city. Don't know if they do a halftime show along the way. I'm not sure. Wouldn't be surprised if they did. Six days, they march around the city, and nothing happens. Can you imagine what the people of Jericho are saying, standing up there in the walls? Hey, are you going to waste your time marching around again? You can't touch us. You can't get in here. You're just looking foolish, marching around. The people were obedient. Even though in the eyes of the world, what they were doing made no sense. Marching around a wall is not going to make it fall down. But obedience to God will enable God to do his perfect will. And so they obeyed God in doing what God asked them to do, even though it didn't make much sense, even though they were probably ridiculed by the people in Jericho, they were still obedient to what God commanded. God is in that business of breaking down the walls of human hearts. And we, as the body of Christ, are his primary way of doing that. So what do we do that breaks down the walls in somebody else's heart and allows the gospel of Christ to come in? We obey God, especially when it makes no sense according to the ways of the world. Think of the crazy things that Jesus said that nobody in their right mind in the world would ever say. Somebody strikes you on the cheek, what do you do? You turn the other cheek. You don't get vengeance, which is what the world would do. Somebody asks you to go a mile, you go too. Somebody asks you for a coat, you give him the shirt off your back as well. Makes no sense in the eyes of the world, but each one of those actions shows the love and the forgiveness of God and could be a way into somebody's heart through those hard walls. Jesus says all kinds of crazy things. He says that you're to love your enemies, that you're to pray for them, that you're to do good for those who hate you. How radical is that? And yet, if you do that, if you truly forgive somebody, that might be a door into that wall they've placed against God in their lives. Remember that tragedy a number of years back over in Lancaster County? Nickel mines where somebody shot all those Amish? Remember how the Amish forgave the shooter? And how astounded the news media was that they could do such a thing? Can you imagine how many lives were touched by the love of God, by that act of forgiveness? In the eyes of the world, it made no sense. But in God's eyes, it made perfect sense. And the most radical thing of all, when, when Jesus says that if you want to save your life, you have to lose it, that if you try to save it, you will then lose it, but if you lose it for the sake of Jesus and the gospel, only then can you save it. You save your life by giving it away, by loving others at whatever the cost is to yourself, by sharing the gospel of Christ, by being the presence of Jesus' love in this world. And the eyes of the world is foolish. The eyes of God, it's the greatest wisdom that exists. For human foolishness is wisdom in God's eyes. That's the work God has given us to do to be obedient, to love others just as Jesus loved them. Because only by going against the culture, only by being obedient to God, only by sacrificing ourselves can God's love come through us and find a crack in the wall of somebody else's heart and find its way through that crack until they hear the knock on the door and open the door and ask Jesus to come in and transform their lives. That's how God is changing the world. Yeah, the world is full of suffering, full of disasters, full of things we don't understand. It's deja vu again watching the media. And much as I hate to say it, a year or two years from now, it's going to be deja vu all over again. But God is at work in the world. 
God is at work knocking down the walls of human hearts, transforming those hearts by his love, allowing his light to eliminate all the evil that surrounds us. God is at work in the world through us as we obey his command to love another, love our neighbor as ourselves. And God is at work in the world in a way that is ultimately irresistible. As bad as things may seem, as often as we go through that deja vu experience of a mass killing and and the media reaction and, and all that goes with that, we know without a doubt that someday our Lord will return. That someday every knee will bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord that someday God's light will overcome the darkness and there'll be God's new creation where the lion and the lamb will lie down together, where there will be no more suffering, no more pain, no more death. That perfect world promised by God will come as he is always faithful to his promise. May we bow our heads in prayer. Almighty God, we confess we don't understand what happens in the world. Help us to remember, Lord, that our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against those spiritual forces of darkness and evil that often seem so active in this world. Help us always to remember that you have won the victory through your Son, Jesus Christ, that by his death he has purchased our salvation that by his resurrection he has defeated all the power of Satan. And help us to remember, Lord, that we are always instruments of your love, called to forgive, called to love, called to lose our lives for your sake and the sake of the good news of Jesus Christ. For this we pray in his name. Amen.